thanks for the intro and yeah let's get started um yeah so here on the front page i thought it would be appropriate to use a text image generation to generate the cover photos so those images on the right are from uh, dolly 2 uh, online tool yeah so uh yeah basically the agenda is you know we're going to talk about the motivation uh, give some examples of the art and then talk about some of the kind of background info and like machine learning techniques that are uh, kind of uh, the basic building blocks uh, for these models and then dive into actual models a dollar two image and party yep and then share some resources and have questions at the end yeah so a brief intro as uh Susan mentioned i'm a data scientist uh, working on jobs, job seeker matching at Indeed Japan, currently on a one-year paternity leave, so have some time to uh, dive deep into these uh, you know, fun models. Uh, previously, I was at Google Supercell Smart News, did a startup, uh, learned a lot uh, from Machine Learning Tokyo over the year, really thankful for that. And yeah, that's uh, basically me. So yeah, um, I want to start out by talking about like why why are we talking about this like why is this exciting you know why do i think this will change the world so i think uh you know these generative models have really big potential to you know, complement and augment uh human creativity right so i mean there's been a lot of criticism as well that oh like now basically all the artists and designers and writers are all going to lose their jobs right so but i think i mean that might be partially true but i think Actually, the bigger thing is that, you know, we will be able to augment and inspire uh, people's creativity, uh, you know, make their work more efficient, um, you know, allow people to think of more ideas, uh, you know, that impact will be much bigger, right? And, you know, for example, Google plans to, to work on this. Yeah, and also, um, on the other hand, uh, you know, these models can empower and encourage uh, amateurs uh, such as myself. So, you know, I don't have any drawing skills. I'm very bad at drawing. So, you know, I never thought I could become an artist. But now I'm like, oh, I actually can become an artist. And, uh, you know, but it's just a, a different skill set. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really cool that so many people can create art now. Yeah, and additionally, um, you know, right now, you know, metaverse is a hot topic i think you know a lot of um, games and metaverses or even like robots in the physical world um you know they'll be able to you know, generate um, infinite uh, diverse environments and characters and items and you know so you know there will be um, an infinite number of like clothes that the characters can wear or like things that they can say you know that change uh based on player interaction and uh you know up until now most games are rule-based right so that's like a really exciting different paradigm and also, um, you know, I think uh, this kind of thing advances the culture of human civilization, right? I mean, it's important to, you know, increase like GDP, you know, like help uh, increase uh, uh, ad clicks or something. But, you know, I think it's it's maybe even cooler to like advance the culture and, you know, kind of that's part of what uh, makes life meaningful, makes, you know, human existence meaningful, right? And this field is just so exciting because the techniques are, you know, advancing really rapidly. And, you know, just like one or two years ago, like the uh, technology behind this image generation was totally different, right? So really exciting. Okay, so now we can uh, go ahead and dive into uh, the actual like algorithms and uh, yeah, technical stuff, right? So um, like one kind of basic building block that like starting, I think last year, it started to get really hot is this uh, diffusion method, right? So, um, you know, one name is a denoising diffusion probabilistic model, right? So denoising means that uh, we are kind of training a model to uh, remove noise uh, from an image, right? So if you look at this uh, kind of um, like a graphical like representation here, uh, first the from the forward process, uh, we can take an image and then slowly add Gaussian noise to it step by step, right? So going from right to left, uh, you might have, let's say, 100 uh, time steps, right? And then you kind of slowly add noise. Um, and then you can go the other way, which is the reverse process, and train a model to basically learn um, you know, given a noised image, you know, what would a slightly less noised image look like, right? So, you know, given X of T, which is a noised image, you know, what is the, um, you know, probability distribution of a slightly less noised image, right? So you're training a, a model to denoise the image. And miraculously, um, you know, this can generate some like, really cool images, right? So this is like a fundamental building block that's you know widely used in image generation now, but wasn't two years ago. 
Okay, and then uh, another kind of basic building block uh, for these models is uh, transformers. Uh, so I think uh, many of you know this already. So just very briefly, um, you know, one way to think about it is a more generalized version of a fully connected neural network layer, right? So uh, you have uh, transformer encoders and transformer decoders, right? So uh, in transformers use a mechanism called attention, right? So self-attention is basically kind of learning how, let's say, a, a word token in a sentence pays attention or how it relates to uh, other word tokens in the same sentence, right? And uh, for example, cross-attention could allow you to learn for each uh, word token in the English phrase, uh, you could uh, learn how each of those relates to uh, each uh, token in the French phase phrase. Um, and yeah, I won't go into the math of this now, but I think there's really great resources uh, in the links down below, and especially the in the bottom right, uh, there are uh, two links from previous um, NLT presentations. So th those are really great too. Okay, um, so now we have enough uh, background info to uh, dive into Imogen, uh, which is uh, came out uh, just a few months ago uh, from Google. Um, and the basic idea is, uh, so first you have this input text, right? A gold, golden retriever dog wearing a blue checkered beret. Um, so by the way, it is an absolute requirement that if you write any sort of image generation uh, paper, you have to include a picture of a dog. You know, this is a, an absolutely required rule. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, but you actually, you actually see all the pa papers follow this rule. Um, so you start out with text, uh, you use a frozen text encoder. So basically this means that um, they are taking a pre-trained a third party uh, generic um, uh, language model, right? That, you know, wasn't trained for this purpose, right? So it was just, um, you know, some uh, model, you know, such as BERT or something that is like a general purpose, a text model, wasn't trained on images, wasn't trained for Imogen, right? So they're taking such a model and then using it in Imogen, right? So after you pass the text through that model, you get a text embedding, uh, and then you use a diffusion model to um, basically consider uh, that text as the condition and generate an image. And after you get a small image, uh, then you use another a separate uh, diffusion model to upscale that small image to the big image. And then you do that with yet another model to make an even bigger image. So that's the uh, general idea. Uh, so let's uh, look, uh, zoom in a bit more uh, on the, um, the diffusion part, right? So to generate that initial small image, uh, so we have this uh, diffusion process that you see at the top, right? And so again, uh, the reverse diffusion process is to learn the slightly less uh, noised image from a more noised image, right? right? Predicting uh, P of X T minus one from X of T, right? But in addition, we want to kind of factor in the text information somehow, right? So from the raw text input, uh, you have to, you can convert that into tokenized text, right? So that's basically, um, you know, you can think of that as like having a token per word or like piece of a word and like maybe some other tweaks um, and then feeding at that into a stack of transformers. And then uh, you, uh, out, that outputs a text encoding or basically a text embedding vector, right? And then you put those embedding vectors as the uh, condition, which uh, feeds into this uh, reverse diffusion process. And um, in this process, then we can, um, you know, generate an image while, you know, considering the uh, information from this text. Yeah, again, uh, yeah, feel free to, uh, you know, write questions in the Zoom if any of this is unclear. Yeah. Um, so to, to look more at the condition, right? So like how, you know, how does this condition work, right? So you can, take uh, the image, right? For example, the noised image. Um, and then you can also uh, take an encoding of the time step, right? So basically for each of these like T, T minus one, T minus two, like each of these uh, is a time step. And, you know, just like uh, with the positional embedding in a uh, BERT or something, uh, you can uh, encode these um, like integers, like one, two, three, four, up until, you know, T. Um, as uh, embedding vectors, right, to kind of better represent uh, the meaning of uh, the 
the significance of like being at that time step, right? And then you have the text encoding and you basically just add all of these together um, to kind of create the overall condition, you know, that, you know, then you use as the input to predict uh, the denoised image. Okay, so then, um, you know, there is the uh, diffusion model for the super resolution upsampling, right? So just a reminder, that's like going from the smaller image to the bigger image. And um, in this case, right, we want to kind of um, like add more stuff to the condition, right? So what it's doing is we kind of generate a small image um, and then we kind of add some, a random amount of random noise uh, when training uh, to this smaller image. And then we also include that as uh, part of the condition, right? So now you're kind of conditioning on both the um, noised larger image and the corrupted smaller image and the text all at the same time when, um, you know, you learning this uh, denoising process for the larger image, right? And um, the kind of uh, intuition behind this kind of noise conditioning augmentation, this corruption is that uh, basically the model learns uh, kind of more to be more robust uh, when le learning to deal with this noise, right? So I think often in machine learning, like adding noise actually can, uh, you know, basically train a model to be more robust. Okay, so that was, um, you know, basically um, Imogen. And now uh, moving on, I want to talk about Dolly 2, which is uh, probably a lot of the, the the images you're seeing on like Twitter and, and Reddit and stuff are, are being generated by Dolly 2. Um, but yeah, as kind of background information first, we need to talk about the clip model, right? So clip uh, basically uses a contrastive uh, loss function uh, to do uh, pre-training uh, based on language image pairs. So this is a transformer-based model, and it basically puts the images and text as embedding vectors in the same embedding space, right? So here you can see uh, that uh, there's an image of a cat, and uh, you know it's embedded into this green dot over here. So this is like a representation of a like a vector in the embedding space, right? And then um, the embedding of the text a cat is you can see very close to the uh, vector for um, the image of a cat, right? And then the vector for a dog, well, it would be, you know, kind of close to the image of a cat, but, you know, a bit further, right? And then something that's totally unrelated, a nuclear submarine, well, that would be quite far away from the image of a cat. Um, so this is kind of the embedding space that is created by training this model. Yeah, so yeah, here is uh, the kind of diagram for Dolly 2. Right, so um, this top part of the diagram is uh, just kind of illustrating uh, the training of the, the clip model, right? So basically you have a text encoder, which converts the raw text uh, into a uh, text embedding. You have the image encoder, which converts the uh, raw image into an image embedding, right? And this uh, clip objective, the clip loss function, basically, um, you know, if this image and um, text kind of belong to uh, this, you know, uh, a pair in the training data, then we want to pull these closer together in the embedding space. And if the text and image are from kind of different pairs, uh, then we want to push them apart in the embedding space. And so basically then we have this um, nice embedding space that we've trained and, you know, nice like encoder and, and de uh, image and text encoders. Um, then we freeze all of that. So we freeze that clip model. And then let's look at this um, bottom part here, uh, which is uh, basically the unclip part, right? So they kind of named uh, the Dolly 2, the, the other name is unclip because it kind of reverts what clip is doing. It's basically converting from the uh, image uh, embedding uh, back into the image. Um, so here you can take your uh, text, uh, your text embedding, right? And then you use this uh, prior model here to convert that text embedding into an image embedding. Um, and so this um, kind of uh, you know, diagram here with like the small arrows, like this is representing a diffusion model. Um, and so, um, yeah, like obviously there's like way more than uh, two steps. This is just an abstraction, but basically it's kind of using a diffusion model for the prior. Um, and then it's also using another diffusion model for the decoder, which um, takes the image embedding and converts that into an image, right? And then it uses yet another 
uh, to diffusion models uh, similar to ImageN to uh, upscale the smaller image into the bigger images. Yeah, and uh, as for this part, um, so this is representing an autoregressive model, right? So again, a, a, a autoregressive model is basically um, you know predicting the next image token uh, based on the like previous image tokens, uh, but this. Uh, method, uh, you know, wasn't as good as the diffusion method uh, because it was slower. So, um, yeah, they did they did consider both methods. Yeah, so I, I wanted to just um, kind of give a little bit more um, kind of intuition for like using this prior model here, um, and basically, and and this is an explanation from one of the co-authors, right? So it's prioritizing modeling of the high level semantics that makes images meaningful right so you know in an image you actually have a lot of information right you have so the kind of high level semantics refers to for example like you know like what are the objects in the image like what are they doing like you know is you know like like the object a like next to object b or like in front of it or behind it um so these the, like the re relation between these objects, like that's what actually really matters, right? And then there are these fine-grained and perceptible details, like you know, like what is the kind of texture, like on the uh, you know on the person's eyebrow, or like you know maybe there's some like little thing in the background that's like super small. Um, there's these all these details, right? So you know, actually, like most of the image data or the image information is kind of these details, right? But you know, what's actually important is the the high-level semantics, right? So if we focus a model first on, you know, modeling these like salient semantic features first, you know, and then kind of worry about filling in the details later, you know, this could make a lot of sense, right? So that's basically what Dolly 2 is doing. Um, all right. Um, and kind of going back to this, uh, like, uh, reverse diffusion process, right? So you can see that it's kind of similar to Imagen. Uh, one difference is that um, they're also feeding in the, um, the the text tokens themselves in addition to the text embeddings as part of the condition. So, you know, this is just in case um, some information was lost in that embedding process. Um, I think, I mean, most of the important information should be, you know, in, contained in the embeddings, but I think, uh, you know, maybe it'll help a little bit to also include the text tokens. All right, um, so that was basically um, Dolly 2. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to uh, talk about uh, the third model called uh, Party, uh, also from Google. Uh, but as kind of like uh, background info, we need to talk about GANs and VQ GANs. OK, by the way, any, any questions uh, before I continue? All right, let me just uh, keep going then. Uh, so um, yeah, basically GANs, as uh, many of you might already know, um, is uh, basically uh, usually two models, right? So you have a generator model, you have a discriminator model. And uh, you know the generator model is generating fake images, but you know trying to pass them off as real Im images, right? So trying to trick the discriminator, right? And the discriminator is trying really hard to you know, differentiate between the fake images and the real images and classify them into uh, real or fake. Okay, so I, I saw a uh, a question. Okay, so what is uh, salient semantics? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, basically um, just salient just means like uh, something that's important or stands out. And then semantic just means like the meaning, right? So, um, you know, like, uh, like what is the, the meaning of the image, right? Is it like a like a person like holding a basketball? You know, is it a cowboy riding a horse? You know, like like what is going on in the image? That's the semantic meaning, right? And as opposed to the kind of tiny details, such as like you know the texture on the hoof of the horse or something like that. All right. Okay. Does the diffusion model borrow the same meaning? As a, yes, oh yes, thank you. Um, actually, that's an important point. Um, so diffusion, this uh, like method of diffusion was actually inspired by physics, right? Uh, like just something spreading out. So like I haven't looked deep into the math of that, uh, of, of the original kind of physics equations, um, but yeah, I like this diffusion, these diffusion models are actually inspired by physics is what I read. 
Okay, so back to GANs. Um, we, uh, okay, so this is a regular GAN, right? Uh, and then, uh, so if you want to then improve upon that GAN, we have a VQ GAN, right? And so this kind of like VQ GAN based uh, image generation was like really hot for a while. So kind of, um, I mean, it's still, it still is hot, um, but yeah, last year that, uh, you know, I saw a lot of like Twitter posts about uh, this like VQ GAN based um, images. Um, so basically the idea is um, you take an image, right? You feed, you encode it into these, um, you know, image embeddings, right? However, um, you know, instead of just, you know, letting these uh, image embeddings be, you know, have like any value, right? Any continuous value, you kind of map them to this uh, discrete code book, right? So you might have this uh, code book of let's say um, 8,000 vectors, right? So you have basically like ID from zero to 8,000, and then there are like 8,000 possible vectors uh, that you could probably, so you can think of it as a vocabulary, right? So you can think of it as a vocabulary with 8,000 words, except instead of, you know, words for language, they are um, image tokens, right? And then, so like any kind of image that you want to, you know, describe, like you have to like pick from this vocabulary of um, 8,000 image tokens, right? Um, and then, you know, you just use nearest neighbors to convert the, um, you know, continuous vectors into these uh, discrete, um, you know, codes. And then, um, and, and by the way, to create this code book, uh, you can uh, train uh, by using, for example, k-means, right, to find like the centroids of vectors. Um, and then you can do things like, for example, do like autoregressive prediction. So like given all of the previous image tokens, you can predict a uh, discrete uh, categorical distribution, right? For like what the next image token for be, for, could be, you know, just like, you know, for language modeling, you can, uh, you know, predict what the next word token should be, um, you know, so, and that's very handy, right? And then, uh, you know, you can decode that, um, you know, list of codes, uh, list of image tokens, um, you know, back into an image, right? And then of course, it's, since it's a GAN, you have a discriminator, uh, which uh, here we have, we have like patch based, like a real or fake classification, but it's basically the same idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can think of this kind of quantization process as um, like a type of regularization or also as a type of compression, right? Um, because it's, it's compression because, um, you know, you can just use these like code book IDs, um, you know, the ID zero to 8,000 to kind of represent this image now. Yeah, so for the question about uh, animations, I will, I will get to that later in the presentation, thanks. Okay, and then, okay, so what if we want to like improve this uh, GAN even more, right? So then next, you know, and basically this is a kind of a general trend in deep learning is like everything is moving to transformers, right? So we have the you know, transformer-based version uh, of a VQ GAN, right? So you have like VIT, VQ GAN, just like keep on adding letters, right? Um, okay, uh, sorry, I had a question. Um, how do we get that code book? Is that relate to image sections or something? Um, so basically you can get this code book by first, um, you know, uh, encoding a bunch of images, right? And then, uh, you know, finding these uh, like embedding vectors, like based on this, this encoding of those images, right? And then you can, you know, let's say if you want to have a code book of 8,000 codes, then you can just do like k-means clustering with uh, 8,000 centroids. Um, I might be like simplifying it a bit, but that's the basic idea. So you basically kind of find the, like uh, the vocabulary that is, you know, reasonably close to, you know, the uh, the the vectors that you would have otherwise. Okay, uh, I think I'm getting a lot of questions. So let me just uh, move on, uh, and maybe we might have time to address all the questions at the end. Sorry. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, VIT VQ GAN um, is basically uh, replacing the uh, CNNs, the convolutional neural network, with uh, a transformer uh, architecture, right? Um, and, you know, like part of the thinking behind this is that um, if you use um, CNNs, right, you're basically um, including an convolutional inductive bias, right? So, you know, an inductive bias is basically like the human designer of the model, 
you know, basically has some thoughts about, you know, this kind of designing the convolutions because, you know, the human like model creator um, thinks that, you know, the image structure should be a certain way, right? You know, so that can be very helpful, um, but at the same time, it's less general than transformers, right? So transformers is like a, this like very generic structure that, you know, might be able to learn uh, patterns or relationships that, uh, you know, in, in a more general way. So you're kind of like giving the model more freedom to like learn whatever there is to learn about the image, right? Compared to uh, CNNs. Um, and yeah, basically the other stuff is the same here with just uh, replacing the CNN with the transformer. Okay, and so now, um, now that we have uh, kind of those concepts under our belts, we, we can talk about party. Uh, pathways autoregressive text image, right? So um, it's actually conceptually quite simple. Um, you know, we just have like a very standard transformer stuff, an encoder, a decoder, image tokenizer, um, which is another type of encoder. So it's all just based on these like standard transformer architectures. Um, so we're, they're kind of just plugging basic components together and then scaling it up, right? I mean, obviously it's, actually a lot harder than it sounds, uh, but, you know, conceptually, it's, it's easy to understand, I think. Um, and yeah, and then basically, we're treating this uh, text image uh, generation task as a sequence to sequence modeling problem, right? So, you know, this has been, you know, done extensively uh, in deep learning research in the past, right? For example, for tran machine translation, you know, you have like a French uh, sentence, like uh, translated which is a sequence and then translated to an English sentence, which is another sequence, uh, another sequence, right? So in this case, we're just using image tokens uh, rather than text tokens. Yeah, and the word uh, pathways here, the P in party is uh, is uh, referring to this uh, scaling and parallelization architecture that uh, Google made. Um, you know that you know basically is able to kind of um, parallelize a lot of these um, kind of low-level um, you know, like matrix multiplication and stuff like across like um, tons and tons of uh, TPUs across like many servers. So I, I won't get into those details today, but that's basically what it is. Yeah, and then um, like auto, the word auto regressive again, it just means that we're predicting one thing based on like everything that came before it in the sequence, right? So predict the sixth image token based on the first five tokens, for example. Um, Yeah. Uh, okay. So briefly, like somebody pointed out, like um, you know, like why do transformers allow for less inductive bias, right? Um, so um, for the transformers, actually, uh, so um, you know, there's actually like various ways to exactly to design the transformer, like you know how it can pay attention to the pixels around it, um, and uh, but in general, like for CNNs, uh, you know, you might have like a like three by three uh, convolution with like mean pulling or max pulling or something, right? So that kind of like three by three uh, convolution is kind of very uh, limiting uh, if you design it that way. Whereas like a transformer, like typically you would be paying potentially paying attention to like a much bigger uh, number of pixels, right? So it could be paying attention to like a huge space like around a given pixel and even to like you know, like um, edges, like the edges of the images. It depends on like how you define, the, the, um, like design the, um, the attention. But generally it is potentially able to kind of like relate the pixels in a much like broader and more flexible way than like convolution operations. So I hope that helps. Yeah, um, okay, just uh, moving on, just uh, kind of uh, like paying attention to time here. Um, okay, so um, party, um, it's, basically a two-step approach, right? So in this uh, bottom right here, uh, we have uh, you know, an image, we have an image tokenizer, uh, which is a transformer model, right? Which, uh, you know, just like we saw in the uh, VQ GAN slide above, uh, we have an image and we convert it into image tokens uh, that are vector quantized, right? And then so that feeds into like, that's what this I1 and I2 here are. This is the output of the image tokenizer. Um, and then um, here we have an encoder decoder architecture, which is, you know, like very common in the sequence to sequence modeling, right? And we're just, um, you know, instead of, uh, again, instead of like translating from one language to another language, we're translating from, for example, English text into image tokens, right? So we have the text 
uh, fed in on the left, right? And then that is converted into these uh, text embedding vectors. Um, and then on the right, we have the a transformer uh, decoder, probably like a stack of transformer decoder modules, right? And then each of these um, decoder modules have um, you know, cross attention, um, you know, paying attention to the text embedding vectors, right? So, and then additionally, also kind of factoring in uh, the uh, these um, image uh, tokens, right? And then uh, you know we learn how to predict the next to image token given the previous image tokens, right? And then we can just use this image tokenizer to uh, convert those uh, image tokens like back into a picture. Um, and you know actually uh, this image tokenizer and detokenizer they were called um, encoder and decoder in the previous slides, right? You know, but then if we call those encoder and decoder, we you might get the name mixed up with the you know the the sequence like encoder and decoder on the left, right? So I think to kind of prevent that name confusion, they they um, use the words like tokenizer and detokenizer um, to differentiate it from the uh, sequence encoder and decoder on the left. Oh yeah, uh, somebody asked like, uh, what is used within each step with a diffusion model? Like, is it uh, UNet? Um, so yeah, actually, um, uh, Imogen model actually uh, used a this thing called an efficient UNet, uh, which is like kind of their like improved version of a UNet uh, for their diffusion model. But um, as for uh, Party and uh, Dolly two. I think they're just using like, like a stack of typical um, transformer encoders and transformer decoders. Like I don't think there's like any, well, there, there's not anything like special about that stack of decoders uh, that they mentioned. I mean, but I mean, it's not open source. So, so, you know, I don't know for sure, but they didn't kind of mention anything special about that kind of like, you know, anything they changed about the transformer architecture. Yeah, and then the, the VQ GAN here, so so like the, the VQ GAN part is not part of the diffusion, right? So there is like a paper on like how you can combine um, a diffusion and GANs, but uh, yeah, for the models I'm mentioning today, like the kind of the GAN part is kind of like separate from diffusion. Okay, so I think now is a nice time to uh, show this meme. Uh, so the guy is asking, is that all you need? And the guys, other guys holding attention and saying yes, right? Because um, there was this kind of like um, very audacious uh, paper name, attention is all you need <laughs> in uh, 2017, I think, uh, which is the kind of like seminal paper on transformers. And yeah, everybody always makes fun of the name. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, I mean, basically you see that like everything is transformers, right? So it's kind of like almost everything you need is is done by transformers sort of yeah um so here uh we see uh so there's a big emphasis on scaling in this party paper um you know like scaling is is part of the name of the paper uh so you can see that on the left um you have if you only use 350 million parameters um you know then it's like okay the text is kind of like incoherent um the kangaroo has like multiple ears in the wrong places um you know, the back part is like kind of blurry. Okay. And then, you know, as you go from left to right, from 350 million to 20 billion parameters, um, you know, on the right, it's like basically perfect, right? Like the text is like perfectly spelled. Um, you know, the background looks, you know, it basically looks like a photo. It's like really nice. Yeah. And uh, here's another example, right? A map of the United States made out of sushi. It's next to a glass of red wine. So, you know, on the left part, you know, you have, you know, two glasses instead of one glass. So that's wrong. Um, yeah, kind of, you know, the, the shape is kind of incoherent and on the, the very right, it's like almost perfect, right? It's like very close to like, if you actually, I, I mean, even if I tried to like buy sushi and arrange it like this, I don't think I could get it to look this nice, to be honest. Um, yeah, so I think it's a good time to quote uh, Rich Sutton's uh, The Bitter Lesson, right? Which is basically like a, a famous blog post saying that in the end, you win by scaling generic methods, right? So you could you know, figure out like all this um, kind of like detailed, like task specific, like methods and stuff. But, you know, ultimately the kind of, you just scale up the generic method a lot and then you win. <laughs> so you could see this as either like a happy thing or a sad thing, depending on your uh, perspective. Um, 
Okay, so uh, party, they also like talk about this really interesting idea called growing the cherry tree, right, which is making fun of this or uh, kind of borrowing uh, or uh, like wordplay on the word cherry picking, right? So like, oftentimes uh, the word cherry picking is used in a negative connotation, right, uh, when talking about research, right? So it's basically like criticizing researchers for like only picking like certain like good outputs of their model and you know not kind of you know kind of like misrepresenting how good their model is uh you know but they're saying like okay let's kind of transparently embrace this cherry picking thing and like treat it as part of the image generation process right um and this actually like really relates to what i was saying before about how these um generative models can really um augment and work together with humans uh to uh, create something cooler, basically, right? So this is like a very kind of human in the loop uh, type of workflow, right? Where you have, you know, human like thinking of maybe like simpler prompts, maybe first like, you know, a sloth and a van separately, right? And seeing what works. And then after you figure out what works, then you kind of like combine those prompts uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of gradually make it more and more complicated. Um, so I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things you can do, um, you know, you can also like combine outputs from different models, like different tools. And, you know, there's just like endless possibilities for like what an artist can do. Uh, and, you know, it's not just about like inputting one piece of text and then getting one image and then just being done with it, right? There's actually a lot of these like iteration and like like creative combination of tools you can do, right? Which is why like, um, you know, you, you won't just have like one model that like replaces like all human artists, uh, like th that, that's just not gonna happen, right? At least, I mean, not not anytime soon. <laughs> okay, so I think we we've talked about uh, you know these three different models, and I think it's like really easy to get like confused about like kind of what uh, you know how these models are different, or you know like which kind of aspect was belonged to which model. Um, so I kind of tried to like break it down here into like this uh, like co comparison overview, right? Um, so you know this. So um, you know for a while, um, you know it was thought by some people that, okay, now diffusion is the thing, like um, diffusion is like the hot new method and like GANs are no longer cool, right? But then um, this Google party paper came out and was like, oh, well, like actually, you know, GANs can still like compete with diffusion models, right? You just didn't scale it enough, I guess, right? So, you know, we'll have kind of these, you know, it's interesting how these like vastly different um, uh, model paradigms kind of uh, can compare in a similar way and perform in a similar way, right? Yeah, the text encoder differences are actually like quite interesting as well, right? So again, um, the DALI two uses this uh, clip model that's you know has like image and text of sharing and embedding space, right? Whereas like Google ImageN, they were just using a model that had nothing to do with images and you know nothing to do with ImageN, uh, but it was just like a um, you know really big text model, and they actually found that it was even more important to scale up the language model than scaling up the image generation diffusion model. So. You know, that was kind of like counterintuitive. Um, and then, yeah, uh, party, um, you know, also trained on both uh, text and image text. So this is like a big difference between the three. Um, also, yeah, Dolly 2, uh, they used a latent prior model, as we discussed. Um, but um, and, and you might think that, OK, well, you know, Imogen and party, you know, didn't use a latent and they did very well. So, you know, you know, is the do we really need a latent? Um, I, you know, I still think that this idea of using a latent to model the kind of high level semantic uh, information in an image is like a very powerful idea. Um, there's a, another influential paper called latent diffusion that um, kind of describes a similar idea. And, um, you know, I think it's a way, especially since, you know, not all of us have like all of the scale that Google has, um, this idea of, you know, generating images like in the latent space, uh, you know, def definitely like this will still be an important idea going forward, I think. Um, classifier free guidance, all of these models used it, and I'll talk about it on the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, one, oh yeah, okay, can I define latent prior again? Um, yeah, so so basically, um, latent prior is just um, kind of this model that was used in Dolly 2 to, to uh, convert from the uh, text embedding to the image embedding, right? And they, they even like text tried a version of this model which didn't have a prior, um, and you know, it was still ab able to generate like okay images, um, but uh, you know they found that it was better. You know, like the image quality was better if you include this prior. Um, so it's basically like you know modeling this these um, a model that first you know models the high level semantics 
uh, and then you have this other this the decoder that figures out the the small details basically. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and then uh, yeah, right now a Dolly two is open to external users. Uh, so please everybody sign up. Um, you know it is you do get like a free uh, a few free uses um, before it starts to charge you. So it doesn't hurt to kind of just start using it and trying it. Um, yeah, and here are some maybe like other notable things, uh, but yeah, let's just, uh, I guess, move on to the next slide. Um, okay, so kind of last like concept I want to cover here is a classifier free guidance, which was used in all three of these models. So um, yeah, this idea of guidance is very important. So the, the idea of guidance is basically like, you know, how do we allow the text to guide the image generation process, right? It's that that's what we mean by guidance. Um, and there's kind of two ways of doing this. Uh, one is using a classifier such as clip um, to kind of like uh, like classify the uh, the image into some like text category or something and then you know help and then feed that back into the loss function. Um, but actually this classifier free guidance without using any classifier uh, tended to work better, uh, which was, counterintuitive, I thought. But basically, the idea is um, during training, sometimes you generate the image while conditioning on the text. And then sometimes you generate an image uh, conditioning, you know, not conditioning on the text, right? And then if you take the difference between these two images or these two like image embeddings, um, you know, then you end up with this vector that's pointing in the direction of, you know, uh, following the text guidance more, right? So once you have this vector, uh, of this difference, uh, then you can like scale that up, right? So you can say like, okay, let's you know go further in the direction of like what you know the text indicates, um, and then so you can kind of just by like multiplying by a scalar, you can say like let's you know like get really really influenced by the text, or we could say like oh let's only get like slightly influenced by the text, and is that kind of interesting actually if you kind of experiment with this hyperparameter. Uh, and you know you'll get like quite different images. Yeah. Oh, what would be the x and y axis for this graph? Okay, sorry. So this the x and y axis don't mean anything. Um, it's just uh, basically uh, in uh, the embedding space, uh, you basically end up with um, you know like uh, for example, like you might have um, like a like five hundred dimension dimensional vector, right? And uh, and basically the the meaning of each of those of each of those dimensions um, doesn't mean anything to a human, right? Uh, but uh, they are basically learned. The meaning of each of those dimensions is learned uh, by the model, right? And here we're just like kind of um, projecting that, like for example, five hundred dimensional vector into two dimensions so that we can see it, right? So this is just saying like in the um, latent space uh, there is a vector that you know points from the no text vector to the with text vector, uh, you know, the difference between these two dog pictures basically, right? And then we can scale that to kind of, um, you know, let the image generation, um, you know, uh, follow the guidance of the text more heavily if we want to. Yeah. Um, okay, and then, uh, all right, uh, all right. I, th I think we need to like um, wrap up uh, pretty quickly uh, given the time. So. Um, yeah, evaluation. Uh, so basically, there's a human evaluation, um, which is uh, asking questions like uh, to measure fidelity or the image quality. You can ask, show a human like two images and ask like which image is more photorealistic for alignment. You can ask, uh, you know, which image is more accurately described by the caption. Um, and then as for automated metrics, you can use um, other models to kind of, um, you know, measure the image quality or like measure the image text alignment. Um, you know, so it kind of relies on other machine learning models. And of course, you know, there could be a problem with those metric if there's a problem with those models. Um, but basically, yeah, based on these um, like metrics, uh, according to Imogen, it outperforms Dolly 2. And then um, according to Party, it's like about the same as Imogen um, on this automated metric called um, FID and kind of significantly better than Dolly 2. I, I do, I mean, 
it's not open source, so we can't really verify. But you know, from what we can see in the paper, it really does look like Imogen and Party are a bit higher quality than Dolly 2, especially with regards to spelling. Um, yeah, let me just uh, skip this because we're kind of out of time. Yeah, so let's go to the fun part, which is looking at the pictures. <laughs> so we can look at a Dolly 2 and Imogen, uh, you know, generating this uh, panda latte art. I think both are pretty cool here. Um, yeah, here's uh, Imogen versus Dolly 2. So you can see that Imogen is better at spelling. Um, you know, here's an uh, image that I generated, uh, just uh, kind of uh, uh, Chinese zodiac animals by Takashi Murakami. So you can kind of choose like um, artist styles, which is really cool. Um, yeah, there's this like, really great book called the uh, Dolly 2 Prompt Book, uh, which is, uh, you know, has all this like really great and like easy to digest information about how to write prompts. And so you can get a lot of the ideas from this. So definitely uh, recommend checking out this free book. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, really cool developments going on in the in the field of um, automatic generation, right? So um, you know, somebody asked like, is there a, a paper you know or method for like text to animation? And yes, there is. There is text to video. There's like image to video, to text to 3D model, 2D image to 3D model. And basically, I think like anything that can represent it as bits, you will have like basically anything can be generated from anything. <laughs> it's probably like the world that we're going to, you know, somehow uh, reach one day, right? So one day we might have text to sentient AI companion, who knows? <laughs> I'm only half kidding. So here's the action item for you today. Um, sign up for these, um, you know, services. Uh, there are free to try. Um, so, you know, you can start playing around. You don't even need any coding experience. Uh, you can just start typing in text. It's really fun. Uh, I think stable diffusion is probably the best uh, service, like other than Dolly 2, that's open right now. And I also like put together a bunch of these uh, resources. Uh, this is the tinyurl.com slash creative AI links. Uh, I put in a lot of resources there. So, you know, ways you can learn and like tools you can use, like both no code tools and, you know, tools with code. Uh, yeah, the slide can the slides be shared? Um, yes, uh, the slides are already shared on the. Um, uh, the Slack channel, and I will let me, I guess, share again in this, um, uh, sorry, in, in, yeah, let me, let me share in the, in the Zoom as well. But anyway, yeah, let's, um, here, I just, oh, okay, somebody shared it. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's uh, open it up for questions.